showing seven o'clock on the clock. Uh, it's time to convene the July 19th Planning and Zoning Board meeting for the city of Tarpon Springs. Uh, can I have a roll call, please? Mr. Seaman? Here. Mr. Kuskudis? Here. Mr. Stavropoulos? Here. Mr. Vesey? Here. Ms. Vigil? Here. Mr. Morgan? Here. Mr. Koulianos? Mr. Andriotis is in the audience. All right. Uh, item two on our agenda is the quasi-judicial announcement and swearing in of speakers. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Planning and Zoning Board acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the Board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the Board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The Board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find against the applicant. Are there any members of the board wishing to disclose any ex parte communications or conflicts of interest this evening? Seeing none, if anyone wishing to speak this evening could please stand to be sworn in. <coughs> do you swear or from the testimony you're about to, excuse me, do you swear from the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? <coughs> So sworn. <coughs> All right, that brings us to item number three on our agenda, application 21-67, conditional use for establishment of a restaurant at 227 East Lemon Street in the special area plans T4B Transect District. Does the staff have a report? Yes, and I'll uh, start a PowerPoint. Very sensitive mouse. Okay, this is a request for a conditional use for um, for a restaurant, cafe, um, slash cafe, slash eatery at 227 East Lemon. And this is located in the um, T4B uh, transect of the city special area plan. Um, the applicant would like a determination on the use at this time. Uh, this is not a full site plan that's in front of you. Um, the um, full uh, uh, scope of what's going to be done will be determined later. This applicant will have to appear before the Heritage Preservation Board as well for any exterior alterations. Um, and it's not clear whether a full site plan would be needed, but the applicant um, just wants to have a determination made as to whether the use uh, could be allowed here. Uh, in the T4B district, which is the, um, the uh, residential plus the office and industrial district, a restaurant is a conditional use. This is also in the downtown district, and uh, this is known as the Smurless Bakery Building. It's in uh, the city's historic district, as I just mentioned. 
The T4B uh, transect district limits the restaurant use um, really mainly for plan planning uh, for parking requirements. Uh, that is kind of one of the ways that the transect zone deals with parking in this district. Um, the reason that this, so that's, that's one aspect of this. Uh, the other aspect is that this is conditional because of the, the nature of this transect being um, mainly devoted to the office and industrial. Uh, this is the um, last, and I didn't put a map, I probably should have, but this is the easternmost extent of the downtown character district. So as you know, we have character districts, which have multiple transects, and vice versa. In this case, the beginning of that, tr that T4B transect and going east, um, really further east is where most of the industrial uh, and office uses are. In fact, um, the building just to the east, which was also part of the original Smirless Bakery, I guess, uh, is being renovated for rental for um, some retail uses and perhaps some uh, light industrial type uses there. So this is a real mixed area and it becomes more industrial as you travel east. This parcel really is in the downtown character district and it's really associated with that alley behind it. Uh, more in um, the character of the downtown uh, mix of, of eateries and just a half a block from Tarpon Avenue. Uh, this is a survey of the property. The existing building is um, really over at the south, north, uh, northeast corner of the property. And as I mentioned, there's an alley here and the alley goes behind the property as well. This was a um, rendering, just kind of a conceptual rendering of what the, um, the use that the applicant envisions. The applicant is present, and he can expand on that um, vision of the use. This is what the building kind of looks like now. Um, and as I said, they will need Heritage Preservation Board approval for exterior alterations. And uh, the applicant had mentioned some outdoor seating, so the placement of a, a patio and those types of things for that use will need to have HPB approval. So uh, this use is in the T4B district. The applicant has offered a parking solution in addition to uh, the, down, the parking that's already available downtown in the form of a vacant lot that is just uh, north of this building on the half block. Um, this, we feel like this is an appropriate adaptation for this building and that this building, um, you know, could be potentially deteriorating and this use, bringing a use into this building could arrest that, that process, try to rehabilitate this building um, and bring it back to something that's uh, more contributing to, towards the economics and the history of the downtown. The use is consistent with the city's uh, comprehensive plan. <coughs> And uh, it's not in an environmentally sensitive area. Again, we feel like um, bringing this building to an active use will help with the maintain the property values in the surrounding area. There are public facilities available to the building. And um, this is an appropriate adaptive use and logical for downtown. So staff is recommending approval of this conditional use for a restaurant in a T4B transect. And uh, if site plan approval is required, the applicant would need to actually obtain that within one year of approval of this conditional use. There were no responses to the public notices. Are there any questions on this one? I, I, I do have a question. Um, the footprint that they showed, um, that obviously that's gonna be subject to change based on the development requirements. Uh, if you look at the survey, there's a footprint or a, on the property that shows the, the building dimensions. That's, that's subject to change once it goes through the other departments then. Because one of the things that, and maybe I'll just ask the applicant that I had a question on, I'll just wait, I'll just defer my questions to the applicant. So. 
Yes, um, and you're right. This is ex an existing building. Um, the setbacks are, are, as you know, with these transects, fairly generous. Um, so zero lot line buildings are, are generally acceptable in, in these transects. But that would all be looked at. Um, if it is not conforming, it would be considered legal nonconforming no, I, and I, would I, ask I to be brought to yeah, code I, as I much as possible. One of them is functionality. I don't have a problem with the building. I don't have a problem. You know, just looking at the, the, the conceptual uh, footprint of the building, one of the questions I had, and that wouldn't be for you, it would be for the applicant, is sanitary availability for, for you know, uh, if, you have to have, if you have to have uh, uh, trash and stuff removal, where, okay. would you put, where would you put it? But that's, that has nothing to do with what we're here. Right. For tonight, so thank you. I'm sure they could probably address that. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Yeah, it doesn't show anywhere on the plan uh, the amount of uh, parking spaces for the patrons there that would be in the yes. building. So. Um, and the applicant is proposing, and, and you may have seen in the narrative, uh, there is a vacant lot just to the north, right there, that, but, but, that extends from the corner of, of Ring over along that I alley. Under, I understand that, but there's, like I said, there's no indication of any parking spaces and there's no quantities of parking spaces. No, that's true. It doesn't indicate anything at all, so right. it'd be nice to see that on there. Right. And uh, two, uh, this rendering, mm -hmm. well, let me go back to the plan. <coughs> the original Smurless Bakery is attached, basically not quite attached, but is it separated by a small alley between the structure that's going to be renovated and the other? Uh, the, to the east or to the west? It's to the east, yes, that's it's correct. It is separated separate. by a small alley. It's That's separated by a small space, maybe. Okay. Um, the applicant may know, but it, it looks like a couple of feet to me. Okay. The alley's on the west well, side. If, if you look at the rendering, um, it looks like there's a 75 foot distance between the renovated building to the original Smurless bakery. And it looks like people are seated in between that narrow space of just three feet. It does appear that way. It, As I said, I, this is a concept. I know because I used to work for Hoffman <laughs> and I used to do drawings, but you know, it's not indicative of the plan. No, and it's, as I mentioned, concept only is to give you an idea of the use. Um, the applicant would have to be much more um, uh, specific on the plan when it goes to HPB. You just so. can't have multiple tables and seats between the buildings because there's no room between the buildings. Yeah, so it, I would let the applicant, I would ask the applicant to, to speak to that, but like I say, it's a, right. just to show there yeah. would be outdoor seating. Is there a, a number of tables or uh, square feet of uh, the area where the tables would be located? Do we know that information at this point? Um, I don't think there's a number proposed. Uh, there may be, the applicant may be able to give an estimate in the narrative. Um, he mentioned uh, indoor seating on the ground floor, uh, some outdoor seating, I believe it, it was stated it would be limited and then a, a room upstairs for um, groups. So um, he could expand on what that use would be, I think. The, uh, how does the city determine the required number of parking spaces for uh, a restaurant use? For the transect code, uh, retail generally uh, requires th um, three spaces per thousand square feet um, and uh, the proximity to downtown and being in the downtown character district uh, would would help with that uh, because there is available parking downtown um, but we would look at the floor area and the seating and the number of seats but, but doesn't a restaurant require a, a different number of seating per ta uh, per square foot than retail well, that, no, not in the transect code. It doesn't. 
I mean, uh, yeah. And, and the city's parking lot is very close to the location. Yes, the one off Ring Avenue. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're voting on tonight, you said this is a comprehensive plan. So they would have 12 months from tonight or like the when the, it goes to the Board of Commissions to decide on whether or not they're really going to do this. Is that what that means? They would have 12 months if they need a site plan approval. Okay. Um, if all they need is a building permit, really the... And they'd have they, to get that within the 12 months of this? Yes. Okay. Any further questions for staff? I, I think I have one just to tail on Ms. <clears throat> Vigil's question. So would we see this application again when it is more complete and there was an actual plan provided rather than a, a rendering that's not accurate? If a full site plan is required, you would see it. If it's a minor site plan or no site plan, which I am not sure, I can't say that definitively, but I suspe suspect that may be the case. Good example, the parking lot that has to be built on the vacant lot will come before you. So you'll probably see the whole scheme again because that, that may or may not be accessory to this. I'm not sure how that will play out in the code because I don't have the specific plan. So I don't have it either. So I don't know the process. It may or may not come back to you. All we're looking at tonight is the use being appropriate in that transect. Yeah, because all this is is just a survey. Yeah. Yes. It's not a site plan. So. Yes, and the city's, city's code does allow pursuit of a conditional use without a site plan. So. Any further questions for staff? All right, if uh, there's no further questions for staff, would the applicant like to make a presentation? A presentation I don't have, but I can answer any questions. Um, I'll, I'll open it up. Okay. Um, when, when they talk about the parking uh, or the having parking availability at the, at the property just north, is that under common ownership? Do you own that as well? Yes, part of the purchase of the building came with the with a lot. All right, so any any parking lot re parking requirements you own the property that 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 could provide the parking. Yes, yes, and I've been told because I've heard the question answered before. It's between 16 and 20 spots that can go on that okay. particular lot. We're not exactly sure yet, obviously. And I obviously, you know, what I had asked before, because the the building has been there forever, mm -hmm. okay? You're not making the building bigger, but it's on a smaller lot, mm -hmm. kind of. And so to have waste services in there, getting a, a waste truck in and out of there, I guess with the parking lot in the back, you'd be able to provide access yes. for waste services in the back. That uh, That's, okay, that kind of. And that is where the, the waste services are for I believe it's Johnny's Tap House, Tula's Trail Side, yep. are all are all right uh, adjacent to that to that lot. Matter of fact, the property is directly behind those two restaurants. If I re if I remember correctly, the, the alley are those 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 are functional alleys, correct? Where they cars are. can can come in and out. Okay. But the the footprint, because I had heard you ask it earlier, will not change. Oh yeah, get, get, yeah. And and the only thing that would change. On the rendering, now the rendering was made before me. It was made by the previous owner. I'm not sure, I've never really noticed that there was seating in between the buildings, <laughs> but uh, that will not be, as those buildings are being renovated, obviously we will not have uh, seating there. The, the purpose of that <coughs> rendering would be to add the balconies back to the front. And matter of fact, in the photos you could see the old uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, anchoring that was there for both of those balconies, which would add balcony outdoor seating in addition to under the, the uh, second floor outdoor seating. But that wouldn't a, increase the footprint. I have a question about that, the parking area. So mm -hmm. 
it's a vacant lot, we'll say. Remember, it was fenced, and now it's not fenced, and it's green. And Well, if it's paved, are there stormwater-related issues? Because, of course, as a guest at Johnny's and around there, that street flood's pretty good even now after they've cleaned it up. So has that been brought up in any way? Does, does it even matter if it gets paved where the rest of that water goes? The proposal that we had when looking into it was to shell the, uh, the lot. Oh, to so do an impervious. It would be an impervious, uh, so we're not going to pave it. Uh, I don't think that would make sense either aesthetically with the alleys or, or uh, uh, make sense for parking and the, the need that we have for it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I know it sounds like it's preliminary, but do you have a feel for the number of uh, guests that you would be trying to accommodate? It? Yeah, in walking the property with, uh, or walking the, the building with Mr. Hoffman, we are gonna be limited because of what even though I'm not going to run the restaurant or, or, or have it, I want to keep the old oven. That is a large structure on the first floor, and we want to make the kitchen around that. So that would limit first floor seating. I, said, I think he said we can get 30 or 40 seats first floor. The second floor is not as big, and it would probably be about another 30 or 40 uh, seats. He, he was thinking in the area of 60 to 75 <coughs> in, inside and then probably 20 to 25 or maybe 30 outside. Other questions for the applicant? Uh, you may be seated and uh, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this application? Seeing none, and you already said we had no uh, public comments, correct? That's correct. All right. That brings it back to us, I guess. Uh, on a motion? Huh? You want a motion? I, I guess it's that time, yeah. Okay, then I'll go ahead and make a motion on application 21-67, the conditional use. Um, I, I, I move to have it approved. I'll second. Can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Vigil? Yes. Mr. Vesey? Yes. Mr. Stavropoulos? Yes. Mr. Cruz Curtis? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. It's nice. Yes, I'm glad to see something happen with that building. Uh, that brings us to item number four of our agenda, application 21-68. It's conditional use approval for construction of two single-family detached dwellings in the special area plan T4C transect district. Do we have a staff presentation? Yes, this is a proposal to construct two single-family residences um, on vacant property. This is currently one piece of property that will be divided. That were originally two lots in the original plat, and those will be divided back to the two separately platted lots. And uh, this is a single-family residence um, uh, that is subject to conditional use review in T4C residential high where single-family residences are classified for conditional use. Um, as you might remember at your last meeting, you heard some amendments to the SMART code that would remove these from conditional use. That has passed on first reading at the Board of Commissioners uh, pursuant to your recommendation, uh, but has not been adopted, so technically we have brought this before you, but it should be the last one you see. So, um, again, this is on Spruce Street. Uh, um, this is the property. It's actually uh, two lots. And you did see this uh, house to the west that was a conditional use a um, couple of years ago. So, um, 
Each lot is about 5,700 square feet. This is a survey showing the two lots and just a conceptual site plan or floor plan presented by the applicant. And as far as the standards, um, the property does comply with the land development code and the uh, dwellings would be built in accordance with the design standards of the transect code. And the proposed use is compatible. This says this street is um, uh, pretty much uh, occupied by single family residences. Um, and then over to the west, of course, you've got um, North Pinellas Commercial Corridor. But the street between Safford and North Pinellas is, is all single family. The use is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. This is not in the historic district or in an environmentally sensitive area. And um, this is consistent with the surrounding development, so we expect it to be compatible and not adversely affect adjoining neighbors. Um, this area is served by city facilities and provides for some uh, infill lots in the city. So uh, staff is recommending approval um, with the condition that the um, building permit be pulled within one year. Are there any questions? Oh, and there was no response received to public notice. Do we have any questions for staff? Uh, Laura, I do. I, I do have one question. <coughs> this is this is all upland property. This is all upland property. I'm sorry. It, this is all upland property because I know yes. there's some wet that's. So the wetlands be actually the block next behind there. Yeah, as you move east, um, yeah, there's there there is one privately owned lot east of this, and then east of that is a city owned parcel that I know is wet. I'm not sure how it is wetlands. I'm not sure how far over that comes, but these two properties are high and dry as far as as far as we know. Thank you. There's uh, no further questions for staff. Do we have members of the public, uh, or no, I'm sorry, do we have the applicant here and would he like to make a presentation? All right, are there any members of the public here to speak? All right, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion <coughs> to approve application 21-68. Second. Can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Vigil? Yes. Mr. Vesey? Yes. Mr. Savropoulos? Yes. Mr. Kuskoudis? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right. That brings us to item number five, application 21-8. 84 conditional use approval for the establishment of a gymnastic training facility <coughs> in the industrial plan development zoning district. Do we have a staff presentation? Yes, and um, this proposal uh, is to establish this training facility up at the um, River Bend uh, Business Park uh, located north of, of the river. This is in the Industrial Plan Development Zoning District. And um, the IPD district, uh, well, let me first say that the site plan approval and the platting is completed on this property, so um, that those uh, processes have been completed. So all that's needed for site development is to pull a building permit for the building. The IPD district allows for health clubs, by right and for tennis and racket clubs as a conditional use. Um, and this, this didn't fit either of those exactly, uh, but um, we thought we would run it as a conditional use just to ensure um, that there were no issues. Um, 
we don't expect the impact to be maybe quite as much as a, as a, as a health club or racket club that's open to the public. This will be more structured. The applicant is here to explain it. Uh, you have a pretty detailed narrative in your packet. Um, you know, it'll be, it'll be uh, controlled around events and, and scheduled classes and things like that. Um, but anytime you have a non-industrial or non-warehouse use in, a, in a, a, a warehouse or business district, it's something that you want to take a look at to make sure those spaces are available for the employment base that, that you're looking for in those areas. So um, this is located um, kind of at the southeast corner of the district. Here's uh, Inclote Road and Eleanor Industrial and Brady Road up here. And if you remember this, this is Riverbend Village, which has an IPD, industrial business park component, and it's got a residential component. Those are separated by a large stormwater pond. This site itself is nearly an acre, so it's a pretty large site. Um, it will be able to accommodate all the parking on site that's needed for this facility, and this is a um, basic site plan of, of uh, the facility layout. So um, again, this has already been approved for the layout and the platting, and this will be in a warehouse style building, so if this um, business does close down or move out, this property will still be appropriate for those industrial uses, warehouse uses. Um, so it is, we feel it is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. It's not an historic district or an environmentally sensitive area. Um, this is a, a pretty good um, addition for this kind of diverse uh, mix of businesses that's been going going in up at this business park. Um, it's really kind of a, it's called the business park and it really is. It's, it's um, got some light manufacturing assembly, um, some uh, different uses the applicant may be able to elaborate, but it, it's kind of a clean industry business type uh, focus in this park. Um, this, the park is obviously served by facilities, and um, this is really a professionally staffed facility uh, that we feel uh, meets that employment base need. And staff is recommending approval of this conditional use, and there were no responses re received from the public notice. Are there any questions? You know me, I'm gonna ask questions. I gotta, I, it, it's really not so much this particular applicant, but, the fact that there is, you know, a lot of building residents, residential building that's going on on that side of the river, is there any city uh, property that's dedicated for recreational facilities? Um, There's a need for that side, and then I see the applicant here maybe moving in that direction is providing some facilities for those who are in the area. Hmm. Um, but does the city have anything that or on, on their? Uh, um, other than, yeah, what, kind of what's already north of the river, Anclo River Nature Park is really a passive well, park. But, but I'm, you know, I'm um, as far as active recreation, I don't know. I'd have to find out and bring that back to you. Right. I have a question. Uh, would this proposed building, would it be part of that new subdivision there? Or an out parcel of that subdivision? Um, the, let me go back real quick. If you look where my pointer is, this area that's to the north and west of the, this is the stormwater pond, the dark signature. This area is all industrial plan development platted. It's a sub subdivided plat with industrial lots, business lots. This area is a platted subdivision with single family detached residential lots that is also part of that whole plan development. So this, actually this area is zoned residential plan development. 
This area is zoned industrial plan development. So this is one of those platted lots. Any other questions for staff? Seeing none, uh, would the applicant like to make comments? And, sir, before you begin, have you been sworn in to speak? No. If you could please raise your right hand for me. Do you swear from the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and no nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. I, I just wanted to kind of paint the picture of what, uh, I'm the developer of Riverbend, and uh, the idea we had behind it was to do like a live, work, play, and it's coming off that way. Uh, you say industrial, but uh, we've created jobs for the area here, it's clean. Their uh, distribution and uh, the, no smokestacks that we've seen so far and don't expect to see any of them. A lot of deed restrictions to keep the quality up in there with the elevations and then controlling exterior storage and stuff like that. So this kind of fits right in with some of the residents were a sold out residential community in the Riverbend site. And uh, people there are already planning to have jobs over in the other section that Pat pointed out to you. And uh, what uh, the applicant is planning to do is fairly common in the industrial sites and nicer places. You don't want to go into a rundown place and bring children in and stuff. So this is going to be well kept, and I think they'll be real comfortable in there. And I believe an asset for the town. I, I, I do have a question of, of, of Mr. Zutz. Um, when, when you were going through the Obviously, it has nothing to do with the application, but when you were going through the platting process for this, dealing with the city and the development, did anybody ask you about setting you know, any property aside for, for recreational use? Because if it's live, work, play, there was no requirement that, that, that anybody said, look, if you're going to be bringing residents in, there's got to be some recreational facilities. I, I think when they looked at the overall area, if I remember when this happened, Mike, it was uh, the bike trail, the marinas, the boat ramps proposed and what's existing and Tarpon Springs. Right, it's sure. just, it's, it's like being on vacation to be here. Oh. All right, George, good question. <laughs> I haven't been to the back of that area, but I, I know that Apollo is a pretty big gym. I know that there's a big gymnastics gym, a lot of kids, a lot of families go there. Is there gonna be plenty of parking back there for your guys' to fill, because it's usually like 300 kids at, the same, at one time usually, isn't it? So. Mm -hmm. Um, we typically have anywhere between 80 to 100 kids at, during one hour, but the majority of that is with our after school program where we actually pick the children up from school and bring them to the facility. So their parents are only there to pick them up at the end of the day. So it's a quick uh, pickup process. Okay, so it's not going to be like a complete just gymnastic bar like, um, like where they do the, the competitions and all that other stuff too. We have that as well. Okay. Um, and the after school program still learns gymnastics. It's just, uh, it's more our way of supporting family, working families in a gymnastics environment. So they get to do gymnastics and then the parents are just there to pick them up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. If there's uh, no further questions for the applicant. Are there any members of the public here to comment? <coughs> Seeing none, I will entertain a motion. Yes, I'll go. Uh, I, make a, I, I make a motion to approve application 21-84, the conditional use. Uh, for the establishment of a gymnastics training facility. Um, I'll second it. Can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Vigil? Yes. Mr. Vesey? Yes. Mr. Stavropoulos? Yes. Mr. Kuskoudis? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right, motion carries. I, I would just like to say I'm, I live near the area and I'm I'm happy to see the variety starting to go in there. I think it, it makes for a more interesting area. It's certainly not anything at 65 years old that I'll ever use, but uh, it's, it's good for other people. Yeah, I'm really excited to see it down there too. The one in Clearwater is amazing, so 
Uh, that brings us to item number six on our agenda, staff presentation discussion item about board training. Okay, um, okay. Uh, just want to do a quick uh, run through of a training series that we're kind of starting to develop for the board. Um, basically, what I thought I would do is just do some short um, hit some topics, give you some context um, over the next t two, three, four meetings where you have light agendas um, to start to kind of set the framework, especially with the comprehensive plan coming up and land development code changes. So um, kind of are proposing um, kind of three modules of it plus special topics. Uh, I will tell you that um, you, you all asked for a uh, a special workshop on short-term rentals. Um, if you watched the last board meeting where they, they looked at the short last round of short-term rentals that you guys looked at, um, they agreed that, that they would like you all to, to run a workshop on that. So we will we'll be bringing that. So that would be a special topic. Um, that would be an example, and there could be others. So I'm um, just going to run through some some basic um, background on how we got here, where we are in Tarpon, the context of how you guys operate in, in the kind of the global um, world that you operate in. Um, I like to go back to the major growth management history in Florida because Florida is or has been one of the most progressive states with growth, with their growth management. Um, probably the the platform legislation that, that came out was in the 70s under Reuben Askew and then Senator Bob Graham, state senator, um, bringing in uh, some of these concerns with major population growth since, since this, the state started doing zoning. Some of the jurisdictions in the state started doing zoning in the like 20s or 30s. Um, major population growth and some of the concerns that started to come up with environmental and facilities, environmental impacts and the provision of facilities. So we had the Environmental Land and Water Management Act and the Florida Water Resources Act. Those both came in in 1972, created the regional planning councils and the water management districts that you know today and brought in development of regional impact. Those were uh, develop pretty large developments that would impact more than one jurisdiction. Those were overseen by the regional planning councils, and the state and the regions were given standing to review these developments. And it also created the areas of critical state concern, like the Florida Keys, Green Swamp, Big Cypress, those areas. Then in 1985, um, that's when uh, then Governor Bob Graham uh, brought in the what we all know as the Growth Management Act. Um, that was really at the time probably the the only or, or the biggest um, coordinated system of state, regional, and local planning that was mandated by state in in the whole country really. Um, everybody had to write a comprehensive plan and adopt the future land use map. You had to write implementing regulations, so regulations that implement your comprehensive plan. Uh, the state was given standing and citizens were given standing in these local plans. And there was a strict scrutiny applied to compliance of the plans with the state uh, requirements and state comprehensive plan. The Department of Community Affairs was the agency charged with overseeing all this. Um, they um, did some rulemaking, and uh, they did. Uh, uh, they were an extensive planning um, arm in the government, and uh, did oversee this lot of detail in that program. Adequate facilities and concurrency also came in at that time. We'll talk about it in a second. So after about 25 years of that, kind of fast forward to the Community Planning Act that came in under Rick Scott. Um, the Growth Management Act did operate 
uh, and, and there was pushback over the years, but it operated pretty much as it was adopted until, um, I don't know, the 2000s. Uh, under Charlie Chris, there were some pretty big tweaks made, but it didn't really, um, it didn't really disturb the, the overall framework of the, the Growth Management Act. The pushback and then the economic downturn, notice the year, were the perfect storm for the Community Planning Act, which was a total, I call it, slash and burn of Growth Management Act. So the Community Planning Act did significantly revise Chapter 163 and Chapter 380, greatly reduced state and regional oversight of comprehensive planning. The plan and the implementing regulations are still required, but, and then I have a long list of, of issues, probably the most important um, were that really the teeth was taken out of the state review. Um, the Department of Community Affairs was disbanded. It's now the Department of Economic Opportunity. Um, some of the, the, the um, Citizen and state intervention was pretty much eliminated. Um, the, as far as amendments, the fairly debatable standard came in to re replace um, the strict scrutiny. Um, concurrency was largely removed. So see, these were some of the things that, that were done. And that is the act we're operating under today. So we do have a comprehensive plan under 163, uh, statute 163, and that statute uh, describes a, uh, the comprehensive plan as a plan that guides future development and growth and plans for it. So it encourages the most appropriate use of land in, in concert with the city's vision and the, the public interest. So it's that public policy guide for those decisions usually includes goals, objectives, and policies, which ours does. Um, some plans have strategies or initiatives, um, different things like that. Um, it plans for the prov provision of public and capital facilities, and I've got the, basically the ones there that are required to plan for. State law requires it to cover at least a 10-year period. Uh, ours, most plans cover 20 to 25 years. And um, it is still consulted for consistency review in all land use decisions. And you guys see all that when you look at your, your applications, yes. Has there been any discussion? I know several years ago, Pinellas County, maybe it has reached build out. And you know, where are we? I mean, I know that's gotta be part of the discussion. You know, we sit here and, and we, we, we look at at the future development of, of Tarpon Springs, but yeah. I don't know where, where, the, where the city or, or staff comes with regard to build out. Yes, um, I would like to, if it's okay, present that in the third training. So I wanna kinda go through this, go through the applications you see, zoom back out and give you the county-wide perspective, which I'm not, uh, I don't have in here, but Mixed into all this wrinkle of the state and region is also that we have a countywide plan that um, plays into what we do. So that it, 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 it's it's the plan, the countywide map, and the transportation concurrency was replaced by the countywide system. So we'll talk about that and then bring it back to TARP and talk about specifics of population, what's our expected growth, our vacant lands. So yeah, I'd like to bring that back and kind of make it meaningful on the ground here for what you guys look at. But yeah, I mean, if you look at, just to answer your question, if you look at, um, we use the um, Bureau of Economic and Business Research population projections. And I think the last projection and they extrapolate it out between censuses, right? So we're supposed to get our first state and maybe county census numbers like last I heard September. It's late this time because the 2020 census was of course would have been April 2020. It was, it was stretched out considerably because of COVID. 
We usually get our numbers a year later, so it would have been spring 2021. We'll get start first start getting some of the numbers, but we're at like 26,000, and the projected growth on last um, Bieber estimate was like another, you know, 800 or a thousand. I mean, that's kind of where they're at. But but um, but the, the growth projections are based on past growth numbers. That's it. That's really all Bieber looks at. They look at schools and some other things too. But we'll bring back uh, we'll bring that back. But plus um, the vacant property and just kind of take a look at uh, what we've seen with that and with redevelopment. We're, we're experiencing redevelopment, as you guys know. So good question. Um, the future land use map is what we use for our long-term vision, and the colors aren't too good on here. But this is our future land use map. You've seen that in the past. And um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And the comprehensive plan was first adopted in 1989, so in response to, that, to the Growth Management Act. Um, it's got technical and policy documents. I don't know, was anybody here in 89 and 90 and remember the adoption of the, the, that whole process. Okay, so the coastal counties had to do their comp plans first. So uh, that would have included coastal counties and cities that would have included Tarpon. Um, and uh, most jurisdictions have a separate talk, technical document, which is the data and analysis that kind of you base your decisions on. And, and, make decisions uh, to write policies. Uh, that's your information where you derive your, your policies from. And then the policy document's usually separate. In Tarpon, for some reason, they, they, they made it all one document, which is okay. So um, I'll, I'll give you the link if you haven't looked at the comprehensive plan elements, but don't get discouraged when you open it and it's, you know, 90 pages. So if you, you would just flip to the policies and you're going to be looking at, you know, eight to ten pages, maybe three for some of the smaller elements, and that's really the meat of the document. And, and, you'll, and if you do look at the technical, you'll see a lot of the information is very outdated um, because a lot of it's from 1989. And if you look at something like the conservation element, you look through to the wildlife and you're going to see a list and a description of every species of fish that's known to occur in tarpon. That's kind of what was going on in the 90s when plans were being written. That is what, that, that was part of what happened with the pushback, is, is these things became so onerous um, that there was some pushback. Um, I make it sound bad, but, but the comprehensive plan system is alive and well. It's, it's a very good thing to have, and there's nothing that says you cannot go beyond state requirements in your plan for your vision. So we have um, eight elements that are required, still required. Oops. Uh, we combined our coastal and conservation. The public schools we have, that's no longer required, but we haven't repealed it. And historic resources is a good example. That's an optional element that we wanted. It's always been optional. Um, and we can have other ones like economic or um, other uh, topics that we want to address. A couple of terms um, just to kind of keep, um, as these come up, let me know if you have any, um, any questions about terms, but uh, you guys are pretty familiar with these types of concepts. Adequate facilities means that the facilities are available to serve the development or residents. Um, we set levels of service for facilities uh, to define what is adequate. Um, concurrency is uh, what, that means that the facility has to be there when the uh, development um, actually occurs. So when the resident moves in, um, the solid waste capacity has to be there. Good example from my last job, we had a level of service for the library. 
it was 1.5 items per capita. So if you had a 50 unit housing development with 100 residents, you had to have 1.5 item, new items per resident added to the library. That was subject to adequate facilities, but not to concurrency. So those people paid impact, a library impact fee, and eventually the city would add a computer or a book or whatever those items were. Impact fees, I just mentioned, so that's for a new development to pay to provide for new facilities only. Um, pay and go is something that was um, kind of adopted in Community Planning Act or actually um, made more available where a developer doesn't there, there's really three ways to serve your development one is that the city builds the road before you put the development in and you wait for the road to be built the developer builds the road or the developer pays um, for the road to be built and it goes ahead and develops so that's the pay and go um, urban sprawl really uh, from the state context and when you read the comprehensive plan, you'll see the words urban sprawl all over the place. That was another reaction to trying to comply with state standards. Really means extending facilities, new roads, new you know facilities out into areas um, that aren't developed before you infill those areas that are developed. And of course, capital improvements. By you know, in state law, they're really envisioning things that are over fifty thousand dollars. Um, you know, a wastewater plant, uh, a public building like we're in, those types of capital facilities. So the Tarpon Springs uh, Land Development Code implements the comprehensive plan. Uh, so that was adopted in 1990. That's Appendix A. If you, if you look at your municipal code on Municode, you'll see a Chapter 13 planning and a Chapter 15 trees. Um, and you'll see notes in there. So in 1990, those previous chapters were replaced with Appendix A, which was a um, consolidated comprehensive, um, well, the actual official name is Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, meant to carry out the comprehensive plan and kind of replace those sections of, of our municipal code. So, um, and the intent is right in there in the introduction to that code, is to ensure compliance with the code and consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, Tarpon Springs um, Land Development Code history, um, after the Zoning Enabling Acts in the 20s but at federal and state levels, our first land development code and map is from 1944. We have a copy in the office if you ever wanna see it. There's a little old section of the city with some zones and everything else is agriculture. So it's kind of an interesting map. Um, and then there were some other um, interim readoptions until we had the full readoption in 1990. And you all are familiar with zoning, which is the division of the municipality or county or whatever it is into districts for the purpose of regulating the use of private land. That's what it's for. It specifies the uses, bulk standards, um, all those types of things uh, in each zoning district. And it, it, needs, it must be consistent with the city's future land use map and with the comprehensive plan. We have two types of zoning in the city. And we'll look at the zoning map, which looks a lot like the future land use map. It's a little bit more colorful. This is often the case at cities. Um, example, uh, my last job was with Hernando County. Their future land use map has big expanses of one color. And then their zoning map has lots of colors. That's more true of a county than of a city because we're limited in area and limited in population. So. Um, our, our, most of our city is covered by what's called Euclidean zoning. Um, that term comes from uh, what every planner knows, the village of Euclid versus Ambler Realty in 1926, uh, where the Supreme Court held that zoning is, is an um, appropriate um, 
exercise of police power with respect to due process and private property. Um, and most Euclidean zonings follow the original village of Euclid kind of model. Um, they've got separation of uses. I gotta have industrial way over here, residential way over there, unlike what you just saw with the last application. Um, and I've gotta have a list of very specific uses. So instead of just personal service, we have car wash, we have bowling alleys. These are just some of the ones. We have a fast food restaurant, a sit down restaurant. This is what Euclidean zoning looks like pretty much everywhere. Um, and there are different zoning systems. I worked under performance zoning in the Florida Keys, which focused on, oh, uh, uh, f not as much on use, but it had retail rather than fast food or whatever. Um, and then floor area and trip generation, because down there we only had one road, right, US-1. So that was a system that worked for us. Trip generation was what dictated what went where and um, what application process you used. But our other system is a form-based code, which is based on um, uh, transect method uh, by Andre Duani. Um, and this is our special area plan and smart code. So use is no longer, um, specific use is no longer the primary guiding um, item. So th this kind of recognizes, for example, in your downtown, in your old town area, that there was a mix of uses that did occur close together, primarily because there were no automobiles, right? So a lot of the reason for Euclidean zoning is the automobile, I can go anywhere. Um, you know, so I can spread things out. Form-based code goes back to bringing the street relationship and building placement um, really out to the forefront. So form uh, is overrides uh, use to some extent. Um, and this results in a mix of uses and really the conflicts between the uses are dealt with in other ways in the form-based code. So we do have, and we'll talk a little more about this because I know you guys are interested in um, how these, these work with respect to specifically in the city, like we were saying. We have the character districts and then the transects. Um, the applic application, one of the applications we just talked about was in the downtown character district, and it's got multiple transects. So that gives you an idea of how that operates. Okay. We're getting to the end. So every local government has to designate a local planning agency. And you guys are designated, so this is your mission, which you have accepted. Okay, and I, I'm giving you the um, URL to the statute, but the statute gives you certain directives to do. You're responsible for preparing a comprehensive plan or plan amendments for making the recommendations to the governing body, for holding public hearings and ensuring that citizen participation process. Um, you are to monitor and oversee the effectiveness and status of the comp plan and recommend changes from time to time. Uh, and also um, the evaluation and appraisal process, which is still, it still exists at the state level. It's been scaled down quite a bit, but that still exists. And you are also to review the land development code and make recommendations to the governing body. So that'll leave you in suspense for next time when we talk about the actual, your roles and duties that are in the code, any applications and how those really fit into and relate back to this whole framework. Um, and these are some of the links I'm gonna give you. So the comp plan elements Land Development Code. Um, this is a very good, this was written in 2012, Nancy Stroud. Um, it was for one of the law depositories, so um, I'm sure maybe um, this has been seen before, but she gives an excellent, excellent history and context for the growth management. And then Dewani's um, transect, which is based on ecological principles, like a human habitat type thing, 
If you're interested in seeing the basis for our transect code, that is it. Um, so yeah, next time we'll talk about um, the duties and the application types and kind of how things come to you. So somebody walks in our office and says, hey, I want to do, you know, I want to open a restaurant. So, uh, you know, how do these things come to you? What kind of discussions happen and, and uh, how are these prepared and brought to you? And tying back to the comprehensive plan and also to the rest of the framework of city government, you've got two, three other boards if you don't count the technical review committee, that touch your stuff that you see, right? Variances, um, historic, and board of commissioners. So kind of tie that in. And then we'll come back to the, the city perspective later on. So that's, I wanted to go fast because I don't want you guys to, to get bored with the training. I want to keep it, and, and this was the first one. Well, you and I'd like use, to know what you you'd like me to actually... Puppet. That would help keep it on... Uh, you have a little hand puppet to, for entertainment? Yeah. <laughs> little humor there. Sorry, go But ahead. I would like to know, too, what you actually want me to bring back um, in the future in, in addition to this. Some, some of the terminology becomes, you know, we're, we're lay people, or I don't know I am, and, and you deal with this every day, and the terminology you deal with it every day. And sometimes it's re-educating our me every time I come up here, and and you know the, the terminology that we use when we look at these applications, and um, so I I would imagine you're going to touch on on those too as part of our our training, some of the terminology. Yes. So. And if there's anything I miss that you want to know, yeah. No, to, to me, sometimes I get confused, but I don't, and it's easy to get I'm easy to get confused, but terminology sometimes throws me okay. um, with the, the redo of the comprehensive plan that's that's going on I'm particularly interested in seeing that we all get more knowledge uh, of what that process entails and and what properly our role as commissioners should be in the preparation and approval of that plan uh, in in hopes that that we can be a little more involved in the process perhaps and not just be somebody that that reviews it at the end uh, yes i enjoyed that very much i want to say thank you yeah. and that that was a, a great start and i look forward to more and okay. i i had a if i may uh kind of a comment because i think you said hey, if there's something you want to hear more about. So this is just kind of a thought experiment. You do not have to give an answer, but I find this <laughs> very, very curious. And I want to use something that we saw tonight in our agenda as kind of the basis for that thought experiment. And that is uh, <clears throat> um, the area north of Anklote River that's being developed. And there was some references to this very unique mixed use light industrial residential that we did see and that was very creative and i th i found it super interesting and then of course my neighbors asked a very honest question about parks and rec and i used to go out to that area often on my bike as part of a bike crew and we would ride that road a lot you probably honked at us once before here's my thought experiment is we spend a lot of time filling out the leaves on the tree and we're going to work on that and talk about whether they're red or green and how big and how small and if they can be together but there's never any discussion about the trunks or the veins that get those there and it baffles me to no end mm -hmm. that we'll use that road anklote road that big housing developments are being built on a road that is completely inadequate and barely a road in some spots. It has no sidewalks, no easements, no multimodal whatsoever. If you're a biker on there, you take your life in your own hand, much less you were a family maybe going out there. And so we're continuing to approve more and more and more complex development, residential, but there's never any discussion about the means by which people get there and get back in a safe manner. 
and not looking for an answer, but mm -hmm. as planning, to me, that's planning, as how are we planning how people are safely getting back and forth, and maybe those people that need to take a bus, for example. Um, okay, so that's just the end of that. That's my horse, and I'm gonna ride that for a long time, as uh, I would like to know how that plays in, and how we as planners can address that as we look at developments that have transportation impacts on our community. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well, that gives me an idea. Um, so, um, you know, we can, I can uh, talk a little bit or bring back a little bit of information on that. And it does, you know, kind of a problem that we have to deal with does pop up in my mind is um, in Tarpon, we have some, we have mostly city roads and we have some county roads. Yeah, and maybe I'll throw that map up too and we can talk about that because so you guys can see where we end up dealing with and then uh, uh, city roads and county roads and, and how that plays into it. So that, that's a great question. I like that one, thank you. Some, something in the, that, that relates very much to that is that's going on now I know is the plans are being drawn for uh, improvements to Ancloat Road and, yeah. and I know that's, that's not really within our purview, I don't think, to have any involvement in that, except it, it would be of interest just to see what's going on with that is, is that gets, if, I guess that's the county doing that probably, mm -hmm. but if, if somebody could come and, and give us 10 minutes just mm -hmm. on what's going on with that, it, at some point, if it's whenever it's sure. far enough along, it would just be interesting because people in the community ask me about things like that all the time because they know I'm on this commission and they don't understand that we don't really have anything to say about that. But it mm -hmm. would be interesting just to be aware of some of those kinds of things that are going on. Okay. One of my things that I've always wondered about this is this, I think this was touched on a long time ago, is the length of time that things take. Because um, I think I just heard you say a little while ago that it could take up to 25 years for development. I think kind of trying to get that structured a little bit more so it could be a little bit shorter because they, they talk about development from 10 years from now. We don't know if that'll be good for development from 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it's, if there's a way for actually to see what the actual structure time or something along those lines, I think that's beneficial. Okay. Great, that's great. So the length of time that someone would have to develop yeah. after getting approval. Yes. Okay. All right, any other questions? No. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I, w I will say I passed out a schedule earlier. Um, the last, let's see, four meetings of the year of the TRC have been moved to the second Thursday. Um, and I'll email you this. It's a little small printed out. This was Judy's schedule. But um, this next month, it will be on, on a date that it was already scheduled, August 5th. But if you're keeping track of those agendas, um, Remember we said they're posted online about a week before the meeting. Those last four are gonna be moved a week later. We're just having some issues with legal ad timing and um, move, we've, we've determined moving the meeting a week ahead will well, hopefully help with those issues. So. Can you email the presentation you gave tonight on training? Yes, I will be emailing that to everyone, thanks. That brings us to item number eight, board comments. Does any of the board members have comments? I just that this is very helpful. Yep, absolutely. All right, uh, item number nine, we're adjourned. <laughs>